Well, my name's not Steve or Dan. My name is Ed. <laughs> and I'm so delighted to be here this morning. I tell you, I am very privileged to be here this morning to close out the 11th chapter of John. Now, I don't know why Brother Cliff assigned me this part of it. He said to close out the 11th chapter of John. But this is also a pivotal time in Jesus' life. If you read the, the John whole book of John, you'll see that this is actually the end of Jesus' ministry. Because at, at the end of the chapter, the Sanhedrin is trying to arrest him. And when he gets back to Jerusalem, which is starting of the 12th chapter, then he is the, from there to the end of the 21st chapter, he is in the throes of headed to the cross. He knows what's going to happen to him. He knows everything that's going to go on. But Jesus has been teaching and instructing not only his 12 disciples, but also the people now for about three years. And during this time, he has performed miracles beyond belief. From turning water into wine, from healing the sick, from making the blind to see, feeding crowds with such a little bit, then raising Lazarus from the dead. So this morning, the title is, Why Jesus must die. And this is taken from John's uh, writings this morning. So the first thing I want you to see is the problem. The problem. And we're going to read verses 45 and through 48 of the 11th chapter. Then came many of the Jews which came to Mary and seed the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. The teachings of, and action of Jesus has caused many to believe in him, but also has caused him to have a lot of enemies. I know for a fact that as a spreader of the gospel, you have a lot of friends. You, have, you meet a lot of people, and they come to know Jesus Christ. But also, if you're not careful, your back's going to get stabbed once in a while. Because people's hearts are hardened, and they're not going to accept the gospel that you're spreading, just as Jesus. His life and his actions have also not gone unnoticed by the religious leaders of that day. They have come to see Jesus as a threat, as a threat to their power, their authority, and their control over the people. If you read the New Testament, you know that they have so many rules and regulations. They have so many traditions that even the Sanhedrin can't keep up with all of it. But yet they expect the people to. So Jesus is a threat to those people. He has been accused from having demons to being blasphemous against God. Although his being God's son, they have not recognized him as such. So this brings us today to the scripture and the question, why must Jesus die? This is actually a threefold problem. And the first problem is, after seeing Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, 
And Jesus deliberately performed all his miracles before many people. The reaction of many was to believe in Jesus. It makes a preacher feel good, you know, when he, preach, when he prepares a sermon. He gets up and he, he presents that sermon to you. And then you come, so many people come and they give their life to Christ. It makes a preacher feel good. Because so I can imagine how Jesus felt. When he preached and he, he, he gave so many wonderful teachings and many come to believe in him. So what does it take for people that don't know Jesus? What does it take to cause you to come to know Jesus Christ? What did it take to cause you to come to know Jesus? But I want you to, I want to emphasize just one word in that verse 45. And it says, many, many came. And I'll do another one pretty soon. Many, it says, saw and believed him. Have you ever seen a service or have you ever been in a service where many heard and believed? What kind of feeling did you have when you were in that service? So I can imagine what kind of feeling Jesus had when, he, when many people came to see him, to believe in him. One time I was invited. This is a, this is a true story, not a preacher story. Uh, I was invited to preach in a church where Lynn and I were the only one different. The rest of them was blacks. Now, if you've ever been in the South, you know what I'm talking about. Lynn and I were the only two people in the church other than the blacks. But after several hours of worship, and I gave the altar call, every person in that church got up and came forward. And I thought it was going to throw me out, but every one of them kneeled at the altar and started praying. I have never heard such praying and crying and shouting hallelujah and all the other things that they said. And it amazed me. So when we were on, after, after a while when everything was over, Lynn and I were on our way to lunch because it was about 2.30 in the afternoon. Now you think about it. You getting out of church at 12 o'clock? We started at 10 and it was 2.30 when we got out. I told her, I said, Lynn, honey, I think that's the most spiritual service I've ever been in in my life. So I can imagine how Jesus felt. We hear, and sometimes we're like the next verse when it says some, not many, but some, ran to tell the Pharisees what Jesus had done. Their hearts were so hardened just like ours is sometimes, to the wonderful sight and meaning that they had just witnessed. But have you ever done something and somebody run and tattletale on you? I, I used to have a little sister, that, a little sister. He was just she was a sister older than me. If I didn't do exactly the way daddy told me, I'd get told on. Tattletales. You know, you're in school, you hear, you hear about tattletales and all this kind of stuff. They're despicable people, but they went and they, they seen everything Jesus had done. They seen how wonderful it was. They seen Lazarus walk out of the, gra out of the grave. But all they wanted to do was take the good and stir up trouble. But Jesus didn't hide his actions. He didn't try to hide his actions. He wanted everybody to see what he was doing. He intentionally did it for their benefit. The gospel is spread today intentionally for people's benefit. The only reason we spread the gospel is that so that you can come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior also. Yet some believed and some did not. 
But what is it about God's good work that causes a division among people? I know that you've been in churches that had a problem. You know, we, we used to call it conference. Now they call it something else. Uh, we would have conference in church, and there was always somebody that was against anything. No matter what it was, there was always somebody against it. And they seemed like their voice was louder than the ones that was for it. So these people that went and run and told the, the disciples what was going on, I mean the Sanhedrin what was going on, that Jesus was down there doing all this, and all these people were coming to him. It was a problem for the Sanhedrin. It was a problem for the religious leaders. But all of it was undeniable even despite the efforts of the religious leaders to stop him. They couldn't do it. But anyway, that's another part. But the second part of the problem is that the religious leaders were afraid that everyone was going to believe in Jesus because of the signs and the miracles and the teaching he was doing. They, everybody was coming to Jesus. Ever been in revival when everybody seemed to come? The whole community seemed to come? The whole town seemed to come? So they were, they were afraid of what Jesus was doing was affecting them. And the problem is because of the Pharisees and the chief priests didn't believe in Jesus, no matter what kind of sign he had done, but they couldn't deny it. You see, they see all these signs, and they didn't have any to draw the people back to them. The people were going away, but they didn't have any to draw back to them. them. So they were losing their little power chairs. They were losing their little power stations. They were losing their authority. Therefore, they said, we can't tolerate him. His competition opposes a great threat to their rule. They therefore became Jesus' most bitter rivals. Oh, we have rivals in the church. If you don't believe it, walk outside these doors and see what's going on within a block of this place right here. The third part of the problem is that religious leaders are worried about the Romans. You see, at this point of Israel's history, Jerusalem, Judea, Galilee were all under the ruling power of Rome. <laughs> it is kind of a strange situation they had with Rome anyway. The ruling Jewish elite had carved out a way of more or less governing the nation and maintaining their temple worship under the pagan Roman authorities through obtaining Rome's toleration for the Jewish religious sensibilities. Oh, the Jewish religious people, they thought they had it made. They were under Rome. Rome's not going to bother them as long as they keep Rome satisfied. So they were afraid of losing their comfort status. They were afraid of losing everything they had. So what did they do? They called a council of the leaders. And the question was asked, what do we do with this man? What do we do with this man? He's causing a lot of problems. They admitted the miracles of Jesus. You know, people say that there are such things as an atheist. Well, atheists got to believe in God to be against him. The Romans had to believe Jesus' miracles to be against them. But their hearts were so hardened that it caused them to resist all claims of Jesus on their lives. 
how hard is your heart? It, you know, it doesn't take Satan but just a little bit to harden your heart so hard you walk out of this place this morning and said, oh, he's full of, you know what? You find problems when you try to change everything. So what are you afraid of losing this morning? Are you afraid to give Jesus everything you got? Are you afraid to give Jesus your whole life because of something you might lose? It's not worth it. And no matter what you got or no matter who you are, or no matter anything about it, whatever you got is going to stay here. You're not going to take any of it with you. I've never seen a hearse with a, with a Brinks truck behind it. I've never seen a casket that was full of money. I've never seen a casket that was full of diamonds and gold or bottles of alcohol, but I've seen the casket with people lying in there that I thought that I'm afraid for them. Too late. So what are you afraid of losing this morning? But... Now let's read the, some of the, what they had thought was going to be a solution or the prophecy. In verses 49 through 52 of this same chapter, and it says, And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all. Now consider, nor consider, that is it expedient for us that one man should die for people and that not the whole nation should be just perished. And this he spake not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation and not for that nation only, but also he should gather together in one the children of God that were spread abroad. Caiaphas was the high priest that year. Now, I don't know how much you know about Roman history. I don't know how much you know about the, the Jewish relationship with the Romans. But the Roman governor selected the high priest each year based on how much that priest could pay for that position. Hmm. <laughs> I don't think I want to pay for a position to be in, in the church. God's already paid for all of it. Uh, so Caiaphas told, he, he, after they called everybody together, now this is a so, whole Sanhedrin. It's not just the priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees. It's every one of the religious leaders. And there's many priests in the temple. He says, you're nothing but a bunch of dummies. Can you imagine the United States Senate, uh, president standing up in front of the house of, of congress and say you're nothing but a bunch of dummies yeah. uh, <laughs> wait a minute <laughs> well that's what he did he stood up he was the high priest and he stood up in front of all of these religious leaders and he said you're a bunch of dummies I had the privilege one time of meeting Dr. White and being with him. He was the chair, uh, director of the Georgia Baptist Convention. And uh, he was talking about the, the, all the people at the, con at the headquarters of the convention. And he said, Brother Ed, he said, what do you think is wrong with the con headquarters of the convention? I said, you're top heavy. Get rid of a bunch of those people you're paying up there that don't even have a job. And he looked at me and he said, you really mean that, don't you? I said, yes, sir, I really do. But I, that's not the same thing that why I, Caiaphas was telling those elite people, you're nothing but a bunch of dummies. You don't know what's going on. You don't even know that it's better for one man to die than all the nation should perish. 
And he says, not for that nation only, but that he should gather together all the children scattered into one. His statement was one of the most profound that any man in the Bible has ever said. Yet he didn't understand anything about what he had just prophesied. It did not come from his heart because God had put the words into his mouth. The song that we just sang, the vilest person God can make use to carry out his wishes. He can change the vilest person that you can imagine. Just as use, he used Balaam in, back in Numbers. When Balaam told Balak, he said that the word that God puts into my mouth, that I will speak. Any man, woman, that stands up in front of a crowd of people and proclaims the gospel, let God put the word in his mouth. Not let it, don't let it be his own. If God can cause a donkey to speak, he can certainly cause a man to say what he wants him to. And you know, that story has always amazed me. Being an old farm boy, I said, if that mule starts talking to me, I'm leaving. <laughs> so, but God was telling them exactly what was going on, but they didn't understand it. You ever have a feeling that God's talking to you? You ever have a feeling in your heart that God is saying something to you and you just don't really understand what he's saying? Well, just stop and listen. Somebody asked Mother Teresa one time, said, what do you do when you pray? She says, I listen. Well, what does God do? He listens. Just stop and listen to what God has to say. Most commentators put two ifs on this particular verse. And it says, if John was referring to the Jews of the dispersion, which was a captivation of all the Jews at that time, this will be fulfilled at the second advent. But if he was referring to the Jews and the Gentiles becoming one, this will take place in the millennium. But it doesn't matter. Regardless of when it's going to happen, you can rest assured it will happen just as God promised. Amen. And I ran across this, and I said, and my, my mind is sometimes works in strange ways. I said, I wonder how many promises God has made to man in the New Testament. So I started researching. And I filled up about three pages. Of, I, I, wrote, I wrote down the promises I found that God had made to man in the New Testament. But just rest assured, every one of them will be fulfilled. Every one of them. So the problem and the prophecy. What are we going to do about it? The result of the plot and the promise. Verses 53 through 57. Then from that day forth, they, being the council, took counsel together to put Jesus to death. Jesus, therefore, walked no more openly among the Jews, but he went thence unto a country near to the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they that for Jesus, and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple. What think you, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given the commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. There had been other times 
that the Pharisees had tried to take Jesus to put him to death. But they were so divided, they couldn't decide exactly how to do it. They couldn't, they didn't want to do it themselves. They send their little runners and they, they couldn't do it either because they were afraid to. They were so divided. But God used that division to give him time for the teaching, examples, and miracles of Jesus to do their work. Jesus' examples is what we have to pattern our lives by. by. Jesus' promises is what we have to hold on to for a secure future. God always does things on his own time, not ours. And Jesus knew that no matter what was happening, he knew that it was God's work. Don't ever doubt when you think he is not working at your speed or timing that he's just sitting still. Be patient. One of the hardest things I ever had to learn in my life was to be patient. When I became a preacher, I wanted to do it right now. I want to do it right now. I want to do it right now. Well, God told me one time and he threw me out of the pulpit and he says... Be patient. Amen. About a year and a half later, he sent me to another church. Yeah, I was patient. I learned to wait on God. I learned that God doesn't work in my time. He doesn't work at my speed. He works at his own. But... This time, the whole council was in favor of stopping Jesus, even if it meant putting him to death. Even if it meant killing the Messiah. They didn't know that. Even if it meant putting him to death, it was worth it to them to stop him. And from that day, the Sanhedrin made the final decision to destroy him. But then there were really three actions that actually caused this decision. I'm going to send you back through John, the preacher they, uh, Cliff and Dan has preached for the last few months. <laughs> the first thing that they didn't like that Jesus did was healing the impotent man on the Sabbath. That's, that was back in John 5, 1 through 16. The, he was healing somebody on the Sabbath. But what did Jesus say? He said, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He, give us seven days, he, he gives us seven days a week. Now, the Bible says he worked, he worked six days and rested one. But the, the, the Sanhedrin had put so many rules and regulations and little tidbits here and there that you couldn't even brush your teeth on the Sabbath day because that was work. If you didn't have everything done by midnight on the night before, it just went undone until, the, until midnight of the Sabbath. I wonder how they even got dressed. I wonder how they got out of bed. I wonder how they ate. All those things were work, but yet Jesus did the marvelous work of healing an impotent man on the Sabbath day. And all he did was tell him to go to the pool of Siloam. But because Jesus was standing there, and he says he, he couldn't get in because the waters, when they were troubled, he had nobody to put him there. The Sabbath day, Jesus said, get up, walk, take your bed up and go home. The second thing he did was heal the blind man on the Sabbath. Who? Jesus works more on the Sabbath than does any other day, sounds like. 
the blind man. That was back in John 9, verses 16, 22, 34. If you, didn't, if you don't remember the sermon that Brother Cliff preached, to go back and read, this, read John all over again. A man born blind, never seen anything in his life, not restored his sight, but gave him sight. And Jesus spat upon the ground and made a poultice of the mud and put it on his eyes. And told him to go wash it off on the Sabbath. Jesus worked and the man worked. The Sanhedrin. Oh. They couldn't stand it. They were, he was against everything they were, were trying to make the people do. And the third and final thing that Jesus did that caused this decision was the worst of all. He raised Lazarus from the dead on the Sabbath. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Now the Jews had a, as Brother uh, Dan preached last week, the Jews had a, a little belief that the soul stayed with the body for three days after they laid it in the grave. Well, Jesus waited four days to make sure that the people believed that man was actually dead. And on the fourth day, he brought him out of the system, out of the grave. And they got it all over him about it. Here in this section of this chapter also, we have Jesus withdrawing from Jerusalem again. But why? Why did he leave? He was already in Jerusalem. Why did he leave? Why did he walk 20 miles back to a little obscure town? To hide himself. He didn't go back there to hide himself. He just went. Why? Because he knew what he was facing, but he wasn't afraid of it. He knew what was coming up, but he wasn't afraid of it. He didn't go because he was scared. He didn't go because he was afraid of what's going to happen to him. He went for God to work. Give God time to work it was because he understood the way God works and the works of God as a result he adjusted his own behavior accordingly Ooh. let me ask you a question when God came into your life, did you adjust your behavior accordingly? Hmm. I don't want to see a show of hands. But think about that. But why did he withdraw those 20 miles to this little old village? He did so because he said, my hour, my time has not come. It's not right for me to be here. He knew he was going to be offered at the Passover season. He knew he had to enter Jerusalem again in a certain way. So he withdrew to where he'd have a little quiet to, to wait and to teach his disciples. And we know from the other Gospels, when the time came, he went down into the Jordan Valley and he joined the pilgrims that were on their way to Jerusalem. He was precisely on schedule. He was doing exactly the time he was supposed to be doing it. Do you get upset when he does not do things your way or your time? John wrote that the Jews' Passover was at hand. And and that's, you know, that's kind of an interesting statement right there in verse 55. And the Jews' Passover, the Jews' Passover. If you go back to Exodus, God told the people in Egypt, the night of the Passover, 
he says, this is God's Passover, and this is how it all started. He says, this is how you're to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. He said, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Hmm. And now all of a sudden, it's the Jews' Passover. Sometimes we are also guilty of changing God's ways to suit ourselves. The feast of the Lord had become the feast of the Jews. Even the commandment was modified by the traditions of man. Read chapter 15 in Matthew verses 1 through 9. We must obey God's commandments, not try to change them. And it says, they went up to Jerusalem to purify themselves. They went to purify themselves. You can't purify yourself. You don't have the power to wash yourself clean. You don't have the authority to clean your heart. But So let God do it. Let God purify you. Let God take the nastiness out of your heart. And then all of them at the feast, they, are right, they were already there for a week or two before the feast actually started because it took a long time for a million people to purify themselves in the little town of Jerusalem. The question, what do you think? Will he come to the feast? Will he show himself? Is Jesus going to be here? Do you think they were concerned about Jesus' safety? you think they were concerned about what was going to happen to Jesus? No, they were just curious. Out of curiosity, they wanted to know if Jesus was going to come. Have you ever stood in the rain waiting for somebody to come by in a parade? Were you there because of the, of the safety of the person coming or the th whatever? Or were you there out of curiosity? They were there out of curiosity. They weren't concerned about Jesus. But the Sanhedrin had already given a commandment. If anyone knows where he is, they should let it be known. Because the leaders were waiting and wanting to arrest him. They were waiting and wanting him to arrest him. The last of chapter 11, verse 12, starts the crucifixion time. And the ascension time of Jesus Christ. So why must Jesus die? It was planned from the very beginning of time. Before the beginning of time. Salvation is granted by blood sacrifice. Man could not be worthy of salvation. You cannot give yourself for salvation. You cannot clean yourself for salvation. Only the sacrifice of the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, God's only Son. His blood is the only thing that can wash away our sin. The question as I close, are you clean? Are you carrying around a heart hard that you want to cause trouble? Or do you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning for this time we have together. We thank you, O oh God, for the love of Jesus. He loved us so much that he willingly sacrificed himself so that we can be clean and have salvation. Thank you, Lord, for the word. Thank you, God, for these people this morning. And thank you, Lord, for loving us so much. In Jesus' name.
I pray.